take a children's story and a song and they will live together. That's good. I invite you to open your Bibles to the third chapter of the book of Revelation if you're not already there. And as you're turning, I just want to share a short story with you. A young boy named Peter was playing in the living room with building blocks. His dad walked in, his dad was talking, and Peter said, shh. The parents said, what are you doing? He said, I'm building a church. And the crowd was excited that maybe his son was finally beginning to grasp reference. And so but just to be sure, the father said, why do we have to be quiet in church? He said, because the people are sleeping. <laughs> This morning we're going to talk about the sleeping church or the anesthetized church, Revelation chapter 3. Now, John uses it, John establishes the word amen as a Christological term referring to Christ. Because normally when we say amen, we're saying we agree. Verily it's true. But also, John tells us reminds us that Jesus is the creator of the world. And that he is faithful and that he is a true witness. This is a stark contrast to the Laodicean church. Jesus is reliable, John tells us. The Laodiceans are not. Jesus is faithful, but they are not. Jesus is the true witness, and they have lost their witness. You cannot trust the dependability or the faithfulness of the Laodicean church, but you can trust Jesus, no matter what happens in your life. Now, the city of Laodicea, without going into a long historical background, just a few things you should know about Lady Sia. It's known for its banking. It's a very wealthy community. It's also known for its clothing, especially for its black wool clothing. And thirdly, it's known for its medical school, specialized in ointments for the ears and for the eyes. And despite the fact that Laodicea had all this money and all these resources. They didn't have a good supply of water. And so they created aqueducts to bring water to them, both cold and hot that would merge there. But by the time it got to Laodicea, the water was lukewarm. And if you were a first time visitor there, and you would drink some of their water, it would be so distasteful you would throw up. But it was good because of the minerals to sit in it and to relax. But if you sipped a little bit, even if you were regular, you'd get nauseated. And what's important about Lady Sea Church, of the seven churches, this is the last church referenced. And the significance of that is this is the end time church. Yeah. This is the church before the close of probation. That means the Laodicean message applies to you and I. The Laodicean message is a judgment message. Now the word Laodicea comes from two Greek words, laos, which means people, and dikos, which means judgment. So if you put the two words together, it, mean, it means judging the people or judgment of the people. Now we know that judgment began when? 1844. 1844. Which means that the latest in message began sometime after October 22, 1844. And it is an urgent message because if we fall into the trap of the latest in people, we find ourselves at odds with God. Ella White, writing about the latest message, writing about the shaking, it says, I, was, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony 
called forth by the counsel of the true witness of Lady Decia. So that some will not bear this strict testimony. They will rise up against it. And that is what causes the shaking among God's people. So the message is so important that if, if we are if we ignore it, there's a grand a great chance that we will end up leaving God's remnant church. Another thing about the remnant about the Lady Sea Church is it's the only church in chapters two and three that Jesus doesn't say anything good about them. It's not a very nice thing, is it? With that expression, if you don't have anything good to say, people don't say anything. All of the previous six churches, Jesus had something good to say. But with Laodicea, there was nothing positive that he could find. Which means the Laodicea church is in dire straits. Now what's interesting when you study the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, when you study the pioneers, they believed that, that they were in the era of the Philadelphia Church, the church of brotherly love. However, the Lord didn't leave them in the dark very long. See, our pioneers believed that the latency message was a message for the Methodist, and the Lutherans, and the Baptists, and the Pentecostals, and the Catholics. But they did not believe it applied to them. So God sent them a text. Second, select the messages, page 66. The message of the Laodicean is applicable to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who have had a great light but have not walked in the light. It is those who have made great profession, but have not kept step with their leader. They will be spewed out of his mouth unless they repent. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Who was the latest in message written about? To us, to God's last day people, even to Seventh-day Adventists. He couldn't be more clear than that, could he? Verse 15, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or that you were hot. So Jesus is telling us that with every one of those churches, all seven of those churches, he knew their spiritual condition. He knows our spiritual condition. But he said to the Laodiceans, you are neither cold nor nor are you hot, but instead that you are lukewarm. Now, this text has often been misinterpreted. There are many who believe Jesus is saying, I would rather you be cold in opposition to me, or hot and on fire for me. But it's, it's hard to conceive that Jesus would recommend that his church be in opposition to him. Doesn't that seem kind of strange? Rather, what I believe Jesus is saying is, when you're cold, you realize you need warmth. And you'll wake up and you'll hear Jesus knocking on the door. And when you're hot, you're passionately in love with God and your heart is open to Him. But when you're lukewarm, you'll sleep and not hear Jesus knocking on the door. Our, our Lord's point is something like this. To the lady of sins, he was saying, you are providing neither healing for the spiritually sick, nor refreshment for the spiritually thirsty. You are spiritually lukewarm, and I will not tolerate you. If you do not repent, I will spew you out, vomit you out of my mouth, you are sickly, insipid, and I will not tolerate your condition any longer. You are unsavory. John wrote this 2,000 years ago. 
we would do well to listen to the council, wouldn't we? We must not be indifferent or ignorant to our spiritual condition. We must take an inventory of where we are in our walk with God. And we must face up to our true spiritual condition because Jesus knows what our situation is. Notice verse 16. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. There was a young girl who went on a mission trip. When she came back, people asked her what she enjoyed most about the mission trip. And there were so many things that she couldn't really limit it to one. They asked her, what was the thing you liked the least? And she said, soda pop. Because it was lukewarm, and when I tasted it, I spit it out. Now when you read this latest message, it almost sounds like Jesus is saying, this church is done. It almost sounds like an irrevocable rejection of the church of Christ. But when you look at verses 18 and 19, they are verses that are called to revival and repentance. So we have to conclude that the latency of church is not beyond hope. Isn't that good news? Amen. We're not beyond hope. When people say, well, the Adventist church is dead or the Adventist church is apostasy, Jesus says here in, in Revelation 3 that there is hope for God's end time church. His strong language his strong language is to rouse the church from its slumber, from its spiritual indifference. Verse 17, because you say, I am rich, and I have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Now that, that word wretched, that Greek word, is only used one other time in the New Testament. And that's in Romans 7, 24. O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? It describes a man in bondage to sin, a man who wants to do right, but finds himself captivated to sin. So not only did the church boast about its spiritual well-being, she boasted that she had acquired her spiritual wealth by her own efforts. Or term we would call, she thought she could save herself. But really she was a church of spiritual complacency, accompanied by spiritual pride. But no, no doubt part of her problem was the inability to distinguish between material success and spiritual success. The church of Lady Seal was prospering materially on the outside. But on the inside, she was spiritually dead. Didn't realize that she was wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. She's really like a blind beggar, destitute, clothed in rags, wretched and miserable, wanting to do right and hoping for heaven while captive to sin, doomed to death. That's the condition of the church. Not a very good compliment, is it? But the spiritual condition Jesus said was nauseating. It made Christ ill. And sadly, they were unaware of their spiritual condition. They believed things were fine. But Jesus says, no, you are lukewarm, unfit for drinking from your infamous city waters. You are not like the cold, refreshing waters from Colossae or the hot, healing waters of Herapos. You are lukewarm, and I will not stomach this. Now, the good news, my friends, is the latency of message has great power. It has power to bring revival and power to bring reformation. For 
church in a way we've never seen before. And when we apply the latency of message to our lives personally, and we take an inventory of where we are in our, in our walk with God, we open the door for revival and reformation. When Jesus examines the latency of church, he sees nothing to commend it. They are a stench to his nostrils. They break his heart. And they're nauseating to his stomach. How can a church be such a mess and not even realize it? Go to verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have, I have required bread and wealth and do not need a thing. But you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. That word nakedness in ancient, the ancient world indicates that they are under judgment or severe humiliation. Jesus looks at the ladies in church differently than they see themselves. In 1 John 1, 7, it says, If we walk in the light, as He is the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from how much sin? All, all sin. How could two positions be so opposite from each other? How could the lady to see its position be so opposite from what John tells us in 1 John 1, 7? There's obviously something terribly wrong with the latest CM message or the latest CM people. The latest CM church does not believe that it's sick. And if someone's not, if someone doesn't believe they're sick, how do you get them to go to the doctor's office? Jesus says, You're so sick, you have cancer. And if it's left untreated, you're going to die. Line three of the testimonies, page 252, she said, It is difficult for those who feel secure in their attainments, who believe themselves to be rich in spiritual knowledge, to receive the message which declares that they are deceived and in need of every spiritual grace. That's why God gives us this message. Verse 18. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich with white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I sound to anoint your eyes that you may see. Jesus says to them, buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you may be rich. The currency for buying gold is faith, trust, passion, spirituality, and a radical dependence on Him and only on Him. First comes faith for salvation, then follows faith for sanctification. Paul said in Romans 1 7, salvation is from faith to faith. And in Hebrews 12, 2, he says, we should keep our eyes on Jesus, the source and the perfecter of our faith. We need the spiritual wealth that comes only by constant and abiding faith in Jesus. Such wealth, unlike earthly riches, lasts forever. Day by day, we need to renew our faith in the Lord. Because everything we need Jesus provides. Next, Jesus tells the church that they need to buy white clothing, white raiment, and a stark contrast to the black wool that they were famous for. Jesus offers a garment that has white, that covers their shame and covers their nakedness. And the white Raymond symbolizes the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. To receive fine clothing was a symbol of honor and acceptance. The Latinistian Christians were spiritually naked, completely unaware of their humiliation, 
and their need for white righteousness, white garment of righteousness that is only available through Jesus Christ. We dare not stand before Jesus with great pride, as Isaiah says, of our filthy rags. We desperately need the white raiment of Jesus. So we're not looking at ourselves, because when we look at ourselves, we tend to think that we're better than we really are. When I worked at Camp Calacqua for two summers as a counselor, I remember one week I was rotated out, and about five of us got the job of cleaning the horse stalls. And it really smelled bad. But you know, after a few hours, it didn't smell bad at all. And when we got done, we went to meet some of our fellow staff members, they did not want to be around us because they thought we smelled really bad. But we looked at ourselves and we thought we were better than we really were. And Jesus says we also need to buy appointment to spread in our eyes that we may see, we may see another. They didn't see if we were famous for their eyesight. But ironically, the latency in church was blind to its spiritual condition. The blindness of their self-deception could only be remedied by the healing ointment that is only available through Jesus Christ. And such healing comes by spending time with Him in prayer and spending time with Him in His Word. And being willing to do an honest evaluation of our spiritual situation so that we're not spiritually compromised so that we're not spiritually complacent and find ourselves with spiritual cataracts that shut out the light of the spiritual insights that Jesus wants to have regularly and daily we need to ask the Lord in prayer and in his word show me Lord my true spiritual condition reveal to me my spiritual blind spots in areas of sin where I no longer see. They don't look like sin to me. Help me, Lord, to see myself as you see me. You know, externally, as a church, we look great. We have all these church schools, all these academies, universities. We're baptizing more than 3,000 people a day. We look great to the outside world. But Jesus says we cannot look on those things. We must be sure that on the inside that we are clothed with his white raiment and we are experiencing revival and reformation. We can look at all these externals and be very proud and say, we are great. But we have to be careful that we are cold not realizing that we need to wake up and hear Jesus knocking at the door of our heart. See, the problem with the latency lady in church wasn't the outside. The problem with the latency in church was what was going on the inside. On the outside, they looked great. But on the inside, they were wretched and miserable and blind. They had heart disease. Notice verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. Lady of the Seans were half-hearted Christians. They had one foot in the world, one foot in Jesus. On the outside, they had the form of godliness, but denied the power thereof. On the outside, they looked great, but they lacked the power of God to change their lives. But the good news is that Jesus loves the Lady of the Sea Church. And because he loves it, he does discipline. And it's interesting, of all the seven churches, only Lady of the Sea and only Philadelphia are the only two churches that Jesus says that he loves them, specifically and intentionally, 
Notice verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. Laodicea is not a rejected church. Yes, they're rebuked, but not rejected. Christ is standing at the door and knocking. And his promise confirms that there will be those who will open the door of their hearts to him. And so he keeps knocking. And he realizes that so many have a lukewarm condition. It's interesting that the Philadelphia church had an open door that no one could shut. But the Lady Deceiving church was closed. And since the door opens from the inside, Jesus asked his last day church to open their hearts and give him entrance. The Philadelphia church found the door to heaven wide open. The Lady Sea of Church people found it hard to open the door of their hearts to the Savior. And when it says that Jesus was knocking, that, that word that's used there is that Jesus was pounding on the doors of their hearts. It wasn't just a, it was pounding. Let me in. Let me make your life so much better. Verse 20, I will come in and eat with that person and they will eat with me. Verse 21, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. An amazing promise. We give Jesus the throne of our hearts, and He promises to share His throne with us. Because Jesus overcame, we can be overcomers. But only by the power of Jesus. Only through the gifts of, of revival and reformation. Verse 22, He says, He hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus ends all seven letters with this statement, He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to his churches. The message to the apostate church is obvious. Repent. Open up to Christ before judgment falls. The implication for true believers is that we must repent and receive the salvation of Jesus Christ. What do we do with this message? Well, we need to realize that Jesus never gives up on his church. He's always knocking at the door of our heart. Even if he sees us slipping away, he continues to knock. He continues to usher the invitation, come unto me. We need to see the riches and the wealth of our lives do not equal our spirituality. We need to realize that being lukewarm makes God sick. We need to know this truth because we need to see that love is always knocking, seeking to restore broken relationships. Jesus wants to fellowship with us. He wants to be intimate with us. And He wants 100% of us. And what do we have to do? We have to wake up. Like little Peter said, the church is asleep. We need to wake up. We need to be sincere with Jesus. And we need to be sincere with ourselves. We need to open our blind eyes so that we can see and recognize our, our spiritual nakedness. We need to repent and accept His forgiveness. When we do, when we do, we come into fellowship with Him that we may reign with Jesus on his throne. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you know this was a hard message for you to share with your church. You had John write this 2,000 years ago. But I am so glad, Lord, that it's not only a message of rebuke, but it's a message of hope. That you never give up on us. Lord, if anybody here gets discouraged or thinks that 
you've turned your back on them, help them to realize that you're constantly knocking on the door of their heart, longing for them to open that door and to let Jesus in. And I know sometimes we think that we're in charge, we can handle it ourselves. How much better in life is when we let Jesus have control of our thoughts, our hopes, and our dreams. Thank you, Lord. Amen.